I'm always uh, nervous about talking uh, in this kind of context because we have a lot of bioinformaticians in the room. Uh, so I'm not talking about an algorithm or method. I'm actually talking about bioinformatics just sort of as a discipline or learning about bioinformatics. So you all can potentially have an opinion um, versus an, an algorithm. Maybe you've used it or you like it or you hate it or whatever. But I think almost everyone uh, has some idea or some experience with bioinformatics training because they were trained themselves. So uh, I chose a title as vague as possible uh, when Nick asked me to give a talk so I could have more time to think. And of course, I wrote my slides yesterday. Um, so as I was thinking, what image comes to mind when I'm thinking about the bioinformatics training landscape? Uh, and the image that came to mind, if I put my you know, The image that came to mind uh, was Minesweeper, uh, because I think uh, depending on how successful I am or not, you might I might hit a mine with some of you. So uh, I'm I'm prepared for that to happen, but uh, hopefully we don't hit hit too many uh, controversial things. There's all sorts of questions I'm going to try to avoid so as not to hit a mine. Uh, what is bioinformatics? I don't want to hit that one. Uh, how do you define the difference between, let's say, bioinformatics and computational bi biology? I'm not going to touch that. Um, what is bioinformatics biology? I don't want to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to try to avoid some, some hot topics, but if you bring me in, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that more. Okay. Oops, my, my next slide. My back, back. Okay. So uh, there's a whole bunch of buzzwords uh, that I think come up when we talk about bioinformatics. Uh, people talk about data, metadata, and standards. In fact, these are things people would say you probably need to learn something about, or, or you should have these things in your talk when you're talking about bioinformatics. Uh, and, and maybe this pyramid is correct. Uh, I don't know if these are in the right order or if these are the right things. But uh, there are some things that I think we do know, which is that there is a road ahead. There is um, something that, uh, that everybody feels, that bioinformatics is important. We should be doing more of it. Uh, we should be going in that direction. But aside from all of those buzzwords, I think it's just this sort of open thing that we, we need to make progress, but we may not know how or where or why or what. It's lots of questions. So where are we actually going is, is what I hope to talk about. Um, so the outline, uh, what do we know about the needs of researchers and also educators as far as it uh, pertains to learning about bioinformatics? Uh, then I'll mention some roadblocks and some opportunities, and then maybe we have some questions. You can tell me what you think. Um, this is, again, a unique audience. You are uh, have some familiarity or some interest in bioinformatics. Uh, whereas if I just walked into uh, a random biology department, that might only be a subset of people in the room. Here it's probably enriched, right? Um, so again, getting back to that picture of bioinformatics training landscapes, uh, there are so many different uh, projects and there's so many different opportunities for learning. I tried to make sure I represent the local efforts as well. Um, but there's a lot out there. Um, but the question again is where where is this all going? What do we what do we what do we get from this? Um, I also want to tell you that why I asked this question has to do with what I spent some time on. Uh, so this is a project called uh, Cybers. As Nick mentioned, it is a a uh, cyber infrastructure project funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, started it with a different name as iPlant Collaborative. It's kind of intentional. Um, we, under, we underwent this evolution from just thinking about this problem in, in plant science to thinking about serving all life sciences. Uh, it's a hundred million dollar platform, so there's a significant amount of technological investment. Um, we have more than 40,000 users. Um, but this last one is really important. Um, one of our goals is really to make this sort of big data biology, whatever that is, make that accessible to the average biologist. So there was uh, a recognition that most biologists are not computational biologists, don't have a strong computational background, but they're going to need to use computational tools. So can we make that possible, and maybe even in some cases easy? So as a result of you know, coming from this perspective, uh, we've done a lot of training. I've done a lot of training. Uh, we've done more than 330 workshops, conferences, and seminars. So that's a lot of going out and teaching and talking and trying to, to see 
Uh, what do we understand about people uh, who are doing biology who may not necessarily be bioinformaticians or computational biologists? What do they need? Um, so some things that we've learned. Um, one question we've always asked for, for a number of years is, well, how, what do you know about bioinformatics? How would you rate you, your own skill? And when we ask this of the average biologist, not of this room, but the average, uh, we, we pretty, see, pretty much see that the majority of biologists think that they really don't know very much. They're at the beginning. Maybe they haven't even really used very many tools. Uh, a fair percent, uh, and this is not to scale, it's like 35% uh, say intermediate and advanced, 12%. But 93% of people say that they are going to need these skills because they're working with large data sets. So everyone knows the cost of sequencing is such that uh, now, what was once a small group um, who uh, have lots of expertise and lots of resources to produce a single genome, uh, almost anyone can do it in their backyard. Uh, so that's dangerous if they don't know how to use these tools. Uh, so they're probably going to be looking for it. Uh, so we recently uh, asked some additional questions to find out what do biologists think that they need. And this is a survey uh, that we did actually of NSF awardees. So these are PIs who presumably have been successful in getting a grant. So that's that why they're on our list of, of funded and awarded projects. Uh, 700 people responded, which is pretty good out of the total um, possible almost 4,000 researchers. And we asked them what, what are their current and future needs in training and infrastructure. Um, do they have enough computers? Because obviously we also provide data storage and computation, HPC. Um, we also looked at are there differences between group sizes or the different types of biological questions that they're working on. Um, when it comes to the, uh, this is published very recently in, in PLS Computational Biology. Um, when it comes to what they're working on, uh, sequence is, is the most important thing in terms of the data type, and that's important. Uh, I think we're, although I'm worried about the, you know, images and phenotypes because we all know that that's what's coming next. And, that's going to be a much messier problem to deal with uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, but okay, that's nice to know. Lots of people are working on this. Um, but then we asked them, what are the things that are important on, in their research uh, now? And that's the sort of grayish color. And then we asked them, what do you think will be most important for you in the future? And that's the bluish, uh, blue color there. Um, so people talk about um, being able to publish the data to the community. Um, they think that that's going to be really important. So there may be some data challenges. Uh, storing all of those data sets, uh, sharing data with colleagues. I'm not going to go down the list per se, but uh, th this gives us a, a clear picture. Um, what's interesting is down here where you see what people need now and what they think they'll need in three years. So for example, cloud computing. Uh, people get the sense that this is something that's going to be really important to them and they may not know how to use it yet, but it's important. So they're, they're thinking about it. Uh, the interesting question is, what is the need that is uh, most pressing? What is your most unmet need? Something that you don't have access to right now that if you could ask for it, you'd want it. As it turns out, the three biggest needs that, the, the, that everyone identified was training. Uh, training on integration of multiple data types, training on data management and metadata, and training on scaling to the cloud. Uh, so these are the top three needs, and this is uh, across all of NSF bio. All of the, there's four different directorates, uh, but the really consensus is there that everybody feels that they actually have uh, access to HPC. They actually have uh, the tools and the software they need. Maybe they could use more um, on the infrastructure side, but it's actually they want to know how to use it. And I think we've all walked in. I certainly walked into a lot of laboratories where the laboratory is beautiful. The chairs are wonderful, but they forgot the, the computers, or they forgot to actually hire people, um, and they don't have the money to hire the, the faculty that they need. So uh, it's a little bit backwards. We have some of these other needs met, um, but the training. And one other thing I want to point out is interesting, I think in, maybe in this room, to me it's interesting, is that this other training need down here at the bottom, this training on basic computing and scripting, um, so interestingly, I think that that's a really basic thing, but people are getting that somehow. I wonder if it has to do with also software carpentry, data carpentry, but even just, you know, how many people here have taught an R course or a Python course? Maybe some of you have been called on. So some of those basic things are net. So it's not only just training, but it's pretty sophisticated training to say I have 
multiple data types that want to integrate. So that's that's nice to think about that. So, okay, the, the question is, we know these researchers need training. Uh, why do they need it in the first place? Why haven't they gotten it as part of the regular training? So another thing that I'm involved with is a research coordination network called Nibbles, um, Network for Integrating Bioinformatics into Life Science Education. There's a website. I apologize, my slides are not online yet, but I will <coughs> post them and we'll find out through Nick to get them to the list uh, after this. Uh, but this is a group of uh, about 30 or so of us uh, educators, people who have expertise in assessment, people from industry and other fields. Um, a group of people who understand that we want to maybe train people better so that by the time they're faculty members, they will have had that computational background and do a better job at, at some of these things that are currently challenging. And let me ask the question now for people who are in grad school or postdocs or, or whatever. How many people in here, uh, in their undergraduate uh, level of training, got some bioinformatics? So how many people say they got at least some? Okay, so maybe about a quarter or a third or so like that, okay? So the majority still may have actually arrived at graduate school with nothing, right? So, and if we think that bioinformatics is so important, to say we sort of left that out into the last moment, uh, that's not good. So uh, one of the things we did was we've, we've just recently con conducted this largest ever survey of bioinformatics in undergraduate education, so the largest one we know about, certainly in the US. But we got 1,260 responses. This survey was extremely painful. It, was, it must have taken them like 30 minutes. So the fact that we got that many responses, I was impressed. Um, some of the goals that we had was we wanted to understand uh, what do faculty think? Do they, maybe faculty don't think bioinformatics is important, so maybe that's the problem. Uh, or, you know, uh, if they're, are they including it, and if so, if, if so, why? If not, why, why not? And we also wanted to gather some information about how, what they're teaching and what's important to them. I don't have time to talk about, uh, there's, there's currently two preprints, um, so you can look for them and I can send the links around. I'm only going to talk about the barriers to, uh, to integrating bioinformatics. There is another preprint where we analyze the syllabi uh, and we analyze some standards that this group has proposed as to what are the core things you should be teaching about in bioinformatics. So that is available. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that paper. I'll just focus on the first one. Uh, so just quickly, I wanted to, you probably can't read this. Uh, I especially realize you cannot read this from the back now. Um, but the, the compound, this is just a look at the demographics of our survey. Uh, so the average person uh, who took the survey, if we look, let's, let's start uh, from the top, uh, we have about equal representation uh, of male and female. The vast majority of, this is the degrees, everybody's uh, doctoral degree, there's very few uh, non-doctoral degrees there. Um, they work at an institution that is uh, non-minority serving, so uh, that is a, just a classification. Uh, they are also self-taught in bioinformatics, so people could have no training in bioinformatics, they could be self-taught, which is its largest percentage, they could have only taken maybe a couple of workshops or boot camps, or they could have some formal training. The rest, we don't know what, what they were. Um, so this is just giving you an idea of this is the representation of who we captured in this survey. Uh, and this is the paper, and when you download the slides, you'll, you'll find it on BioArchive bio as a preprint. Okay, so um, we asked them uh, four specific questions, and we, our approach to the survey was uh, a coded keyword analysis. So rather than having click bubbles or do, you know, tell us of, of a menu of items what they thought, we just let them tell us in text what they, what they wanted to answer to this question. It makes it more painful for us because we had to uh, score those and we had two groups independently score that, but it's much richer the first time around. Next time we might have a better chance of giving them just uh, multiple choice questions, but here we analyze these four questions. Uh, the first question is what do you think are the most important challenges facing those uh, educating undergraduates? And there was 700 free text responses uh, then we asked them what level of courses uh, would you like to include um, bioinformatics content and then t just tell us why, why can't you do that now um, if you're trying to do it. If you, want, if you said, hey, I'd love to put this into my 
second uh, 200 level molecular bio <coughs> intro, but why aren't you doing that? Um, if you can tell us. Uh, for people who told us they're not integrating bioinformatics, we said, well, why not? What's preventing you? Uh, and then also we asked them, are there any technical reasons why you can't do it? We don't have a computer lab, or there's no electricity in our university. Whatever the reason was, they could tell us, and that would allow us also to know if there's some other barrier. So 95% of the respondents indicated that bioinformatics should be integrated. So in other words, the vast majority of faculty also all agree that they should be teaching bioinformatics in their classrooms, but only 40% of faculty actually do that. And this is somewhat loosely defined. If they spent two hours on NCBI doing blast search, maybe that was bioinformatics for them. Someone else might have uh, had a whole course on intro to machine learning. Uh, so you can imagine there is some uh, difference of what people self-reported, but that's essentially what we have. And uh, of the, the, the top needs, the top barriers, again, we see the same thing. That training is the number one barrier. So the faculty feel that they don't have the training to teach bioinformatics, and so they basically say, well, I'm not teaching it. It's not, that's, that's logical, it makes sense to me. Um, but it's something that no one has really captured the data on, so we, we can show that. Um, the next thing is uh, the student issue. So uh, we've coded the issues as to who's, well, maybe who's to blame. Is it the faculty's fault? The student's fault? Is it the fault of the university somehow because they don't have administrative support? Um, but the next issue is students. So uh, they think that the students, this group of faculty think that students don't have the background or skills. Uh, so that's another bar barrier to teaching it. Um, some believe that the students just aren't interested in bioinformatics. So maybe I'm not going to teach it because if I put the word bioinformatics in my course title, no one registers, and that looks bad uh, to my need, and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the training is the biggest need. Um, now, another thing that we find there is there are differences for different faculty, uh, and, and even for students, uh, in terms of how you perceive these barriers. So 41% of faculty who were underrepresented minorities report uh, training barriers versus 28% of non-URM faculty. So uh, minority faculty are more likely to say that they're experiencing a training barrier. So maybe they got even less training in their um, preparation as faculty members. Uh, these are some examples of uh, the, the free text responses, or just a few representative ones. Um, but I think there are ones that we all agree with and can say that, that makes sense. You know, we, didn't, we earned our PhD before bioinformatics was used. Uh, it changes a lot, uh, and we don't have that expertise a lack of training. And there are other ones, all of this is on GitHub, so you can look at the more juicy comments where people complain about the med school controls our curriculum, and so we can't teach what they don't want us to teach. Uh, you can go through and see those. Um, the barriers also differ based upon what institution you're at. Uh, so if you are at a doctoral institution, uh, you're, you're less likely to report training as a barrier. Um, if you are at an associate's institution, you still report it, but interestingly, it's the group that's in the middle. So if you are at a baccalaureate uh, institution, you report the highest barrier. Uh, so there's difference, and I think that these people are trying harder. The people at the associate's institution may not have as many data-intensive courses, so maybe they're not trying to implement. Um, and, and there's still a barrier at the doctoral granting institutions, but presumably those faculty have uh, more resources. Uh, you can also start to see that if you're at the doctoral institutions, the reason why you're not succeeding is more likely to be the students who are coming to you with a lack of background skills and knowledge. We'll see this again. Um, but there are definitely differences in perception. Uh, at the master's level, nobody, no, no, none of the students care. Uh, so this is, there are diff diff differences that we see uh, based upon what institution you come from. Now this one is a little bit hard to interpret, so let me try to do this. First of all, this is a, a multiple correspondence analysis. It's kind of like a PCA plot. It's, it's related to that, it's a special case. Uh, here, don't try to pick out too many details. I'll just try to show you the overall thing of what's important. So each of these uh, large uh, ellipses uh, are 80% of the faculty that fall in that category. So the categories, uh, this green one is a baccalaureate institution. This is a master's institution. This is a doctoral institution in this one. 
and this one by itself up here are uh, the folks at the associate's degree. Uh, so when you look at this in detail, you're trying to see which answers or which qualitative um, categories are or correspond to which other qualitative categories. And what it turns out, the, the trend is, is that people at the associate's institutions are off by themselves, more likely to be minority-serving institutions, more likely to not be integrating bioinformatics, and more likely not to have any training. Um, the other different institutions sort of fall along a little bit of a spectrum. And here, in the doctoral end, you're more likely to be formally trained, uh, teaching a dedicated course in bioinformatics, uh, et cetera. Here at the baccalaureate institution, you're more on the other end. But you can, as you take time to study it, not now because we have pizza coming later, uh, you can start to see some trends. Um, additional trend, one that's sort of out of this is that, is that if you are at a minority serving institution, so this is institutions that uh, cater to minority populations, not that you as yourself as a faculty necessarily are from there, uh, only 23% of them report integrating bioinformatics versus 43% at a non-minority serving institution. In other words, the MSIs are less likely to be teaching this. So this all makes sense from what we've seen. Uh, here is a look, this is a simpler one, um, but here is a look at uh, how the bioinformatics teaching is, is how that's being done or not, uh, and how that correlates with things. So this circle here are folks who are teaching dedicated bioinformatics course. So your course is a bioinformatics course of some type. Uh, this one in particular is if you're just integrating bioinformatics, so you're teaching a life science course, but maybe you have a unit that includes some type of bioinformatics or your labs include some type. And these folks in blue are not integrating bioinformatics at all. And so again, you can see some separation and it correlates with things that we, we found earlier, not integrating associates, minority serving, versus dedicated courses are more likely to happen at the doctoral institution. Um, Again, differences in perceptions. If you are teaching dedicated courses, uh, you're the most dissatisfied with your students, and you report that they have more issues and they're not prepared to take your dedicated course versus if you're just integrating bioinformatics. So these are just a few. I won't go into in too much detail. I have to keep moving. But those are a few uh, highlights from the survey. One other one is that we were surprised by is that the new and better trained faculty aren't integrating bioinformatics. Uh, into their teaching. So here is the percent of faculty who had some type of formal bioinformatics training. They got trained somewhere along the line formally, not workshops, but they have a certificate, maybe even a degree. And as you look at the latest cohort, almost half of these folks had some type of formal bioinformatics training. But when we ask you, in your teaching, how many of you are integrating bioinformatics, they were the least likely to report that they are actually integrating it into their classroom. So you might have thought that this problem will just evaporate as we train better people. Surely they'll bring it into the classroom. These data suggest that maybe that's not happening. Uh, the people who were uh, graduating uh, longer, uh, long, far, further back, they're more likely uh, by about double to, to be integrating it. So that's an interesting question. And uh, this one is showing you by degree year. Uh, the key thing to pay attention to is that all the other decades sort of fall on the same spectrum, but the folks from 2010 to 16 are pushed out here, and they are not uh, integrating. And maybe they're more likely to be at some of these other institutions where their career path is not letting them shape the curriculum. That would be a great question for us to follow up on. Uh, also, I have no, we have no idea about this. Uh, this is a different question. We asked about their access to uh, technical um, resources. Um, this is male and this is female. And so people who reported that they don't have access to a computer lab nearly double for women than for men. And also lack of access to IT support um, or inadequate computers. We're not sure why. When we look at the, they're placed at the same institutions and the same ratio. So we have to ask, we have to find out why. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, that's, that's interesting, um, but it was worth putting up there. So um, to, to sum this up and move on, because I don't have much time, I'm sure. Uh, what do we know about the needs of researchers and educators? 
All right, so researchers and educators are still experiencing a training gap. We are not at full bioinformatics. Uh, there's more to be done. Uh, training is a more pressing need than technology and infrastructure, so it's not access to these physical things. Uh, research training needs are sophisticated, and they may be evolving, so people aren't just asking for, I need to know how to script something in R, no, I need to take these really large data sets and integrate them. So those are, that's nice to hear, I like that. Um, training, oh, faculty training does not mean that you're using it in the classroom. So that's bad if that's true. That means that if we're investing in training people and they're not going back into the classroom, even now they have this better training, then what's going on? We need to find, is that true? And then what do we do about that? And there's some disparities in training that need to, that exist. Uh, there's differences at minority-serving institutions. There, there are maybe differences. We didn't see a lot of differences by sex in any other um, way that we looked. So there are, but there are some disparities that we need to understand. Okay, uh, the last part of my talk will be quicker because I know I'm running out. Uh, so what are some roadblocks and some things? Uh, how can we be better at at helping uh, folks? Because uh, one thing that I showed earlier and that we're talking about. The vast majority of our bioinformatics training is informal. So in the survey, we saw most people are self-taught in bioinformatics or other folks took workshops. Mo we have a lot of researchers who aren't going anywhere. If you're looking for a job, you kind of realize that, uh, that it can be hard. There's not a lot of open positions in every single category. So nobody is going to go back to undergrad. Um, so formal, informal training is the way a lot of people are being educated in bioinformatics. Uh, so can we focus on that and make that better? What are the roadblocks? What are the opportunities? Uh, well, here is a roadblock. And this is a recent paper uh, called Null Effects of Boot Camps and Short tra tra uh, Format Training for PhD Students in the Life Sciences. All right, uh, so this was a very big and sophisticated paper uh, study. They looked at, it was a longitudinal study of 294 PhD students from 53 institutions. So they looked at these students for a number of years. And they looked at 115 variables to ask the question, is there a difference between students who took these boot camps uh, and workshops and those who did not? And they looked, they literally looked. They didn't ask you a question, do you feel good about yourself? Do you think you're a superstar bioinformatics person? They actually said, send us your abstracts and we're going to evaluate them. Uh, what's your publication record? Um, there were some attitudinal assessments, but they really actually evaluated these students quite thoroughly and students who did not take any type of workshop. Uh, so all of these things were done. They graded, they scored, they coded. And what they found was that they couldn't find any difference between people who took boot camps and people who did not. In other words, boot camps and workshops have no impact on your success. How many people have taken a boot, boot, boot camp or workshop here in training in bioinformatics? Don't, you could, I should have asked, look, the hands don't go up as fast now. You can raise your hand. How many took a boot camp or workshop in bioinformatics, right? We all, if one was coming tomorrow, I would take it if it was on something that I, would, uh, I hadn't learned. Um, the thing is, is that this is consistent with all of the research in pedagogy, which is essentially short-term intensive learning does not really lead uh, to uh, sustainable learning. It's very difficult. And there are some disagreements about this paper and controversy. I, I might talk a little. But the, the, the thing that is, it, th this is just really true from, from et, not just this paper, but from lots of other research is that it's very difficult in two days or two weeks to, to get something that someone is going to uh, really learn in depth a particular subject or a particular topic. Now, that's not to say it can't be done. However, if our informal learning is based upon boot camps and short form of trainings, we better know what the right way to do it is. Otherwise, we have a lot of people who are just coming up with boot camps and workshops that aren't really achieving what they think. And if I ask people in this room, hey, would you help me put together a workshop on neural networks, on supervised learning, there are a lot of people in this room that say, yeah, let's do this and let's do that. But the, the, the point is that it's not as easy as we may think. Now, actually, going back to the Nibble survey, um, this is not 
some, we didn't publish this figure in the paper, but we found this effect. Uh, and the effect is, this is asking people, uh, based upon what type of training they had, uh, what barriers do you face? And it turned out that if, uh, if how many people reported that training is a barrier for them? So this is the question. Is training a barrier for you? People who took no training said at about this level, you know, 28%, no training isn't a barrier for me. Maybe they, they're not interested. The people who reported training as the biggest barrier were the people who took workshops and boot camps. And in fact, the education literature says that the people who take work, workshops and boot camps, it's actually, you turn out worse for taking a bad workshop or a bad boot camp than if you had taken nothing at all. So we actually see this effect in our data that if you took a workshop and a boot camp, I guess you just leave knowing what you don't know and feeling bad. Or you got discouraged or something happened, but those people suffer. Um, and it's, it's bad because they came to the workshop hoping they're going to get something. Okay, uh, so there are a number of people in, in the, in this, who know about education in this context who we need to pay attention to. Uh, when you get the slides, you can look up the references. This is one by Campbell and Neve. Um, but they're looking at you know, quality uh, in genomics and bioinformatics education research. They point out problems. Uh, so they analyze assessments. Uh, let's say you take a workshop and you do a, a survey after. Uh, they, did, they looked at that. And they said most people are looking at what we call summative learning gains. In other words, you take a test at the end of your workshop. Did you pass that or did you do well on that? Um, so we don't know about the process of learning, whether that was successful. That's called formative learning, formative assessment. And they said that less than 10% of studies really provided what they call reliability and validity evidence for assessment. I don't want to go into what this means, because um, maybe many of you are not from that background, but essentially, it's really easy to ask a survey question. Did you like my workshop? But what you don't know is how the answer, yes or no, actually corresponds to the truth. Okay, of whether when someone says yes, they mean yes. Or if I ask a math question uh, about, dip, let's say I'm, asked, I'm teaching a course on differential equations, and I ask you the question, what's five plus five on that, on that differential equation test? Okay, you said 10. Uh, so everyone got 100 on that question. But my question really told me nothing about your ability to solve differential equations. The same is the truth of any survey question. Unless it's validated, we don't know if it's telling us what we think it's telling us. Uh, so do, doesn't training work? I mean, if you've taken a boot camp, now maybe you're thinking you should get your money back because you, I just told you it doesn't work. It does work and it can work. Um, this is local, actually, Michelle's here. Uh, we, we know that there are positive impacts that we can document and measure, but that's not always done. And if the workshop and the boot camp is, is, is not set up uh, properly, then we may not have the impact we think we're having. Uh, so I'm going to draw attention to, and I'm racing towards the end here. Um, this is work by somebody, if you're interested in this topic, you should look up and, and, and know, Rochelle, Rochelle Trachtenberg. Uh, she's a statistician and a cognitive scientist, and she really talks about how you can bring the tools of pedagogy into informal learning. That's one of the things she uh, works on, because we really have to have evidence-based training and assessment. So some key insights that you would get from reading her and other literature is that we have to remember that there's a difference between formal and informing tra informal training. Much of the times when people are talking about education um, or uh, education literature, they're talking about sitting down for a semester-long course. And we, doing a training workshop or boot camp, aren't there for a semester. So we have to know that that's training. And skill acquisition is usually what you're working on in a, in a boot camp or a workshop. So we have to think about a different context. Uh, any good training has to have clear learning outcomes. So these are things that trainers need to think about. And it sounds obvious, but uh, training, uh, your, your learners can only reach the level of skill. You, I'm sorry, this typo. Your, your learners can only reach the level of skill you're actually convey, able to convey in your course. Um, so in other words, people can only learn what you teach them. And if you are teaching someone to do intro RNA-seq, that's great, wonderful course. I would take that course in a minute. But when they go to do their own RNA-seq project, they're doing advanced RNA-seq. They're going to run into problems. 
So your workshop and your boot camp isn't going to help them get to advanced RNA-seq unless they sign up for that course too. So we have to actually think about some of these things. I can't go into all of those insights now, but I hope people start thinking. If you're doing any type of informal training, a lot of cognitive science needs to be feeding into that. Into that. And it's not happening um, very often. So we need, as a community, to become better. Uh, and learners have to be guided on how, why, and when the skills that they're learning should be used. And often in two days, we never get to that topic. Uh, so we're not doing a service by just spreading some information that may be nice, but may not impact them. Uh, I want to throw a nod out to Software and Data Carpentry. So these are some organizations some of you may know, and I've been involved with some of them. Um, the reason why I throw them out here, and this is the opportunity part of my talk, is that they're doing a lot of things right, and that, that I think that a lot of us can learn from that in our informal context. Uh, an example of this is the Genomics Data Carpentry set of lessons, where we've gone from uh, 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 the lessons being developed in 2015 from a group of people who had some expertise, um, to really thinking about lessons and thinking about training, informal training, as a global problem, where you have lots of people, community members from all around, who are able to work on the lessons, refine them. Uh, it, it is a style of collaborative lesson development and even in instruction for the trainers that really make their um, approach to informal learning uh, something that you should look into. Uh, I won't go into the learning goals of what the, that course involves, we don't have time, um, but I will say we're starting to do some assessments, and this is just one of the short uh, six-term, uh, six-month assessments, but we do see that uh, respondents are, are more confident in, in using the tools that were covered compared to what they researched before, or what they did before the workshop, that they are thinking about reproducibility in science, uh, that they are have increased confidence of working with their data, and that people are recommending the workshop. So these are the first thing, um, but these are still attitudinal assessments. So we're working on some actual uh, skills assessments that we can learn if people are doing it. But I want to throw a nod out to them because uh, there's a lot we could learn, and maybe in the discussion people will have questions. Um, so roadblocks and opportunities. There's a lot of room for improvement on how we assess impact of training, including coordinating and standardizing how we do training, that's going to be something that hasn't really been done a lot. Uh, since the majority of bioinformatics education is and maybe will remain informal, we have to think about not I'm going to throw a workshop, but I'm going to integrate what we know from cognitive science to make those workshops more effective. And uh, Carpentry's approach is succeeding in a lot of ways. I think it's self-serving because I'm a member of the community, but uh, I think we need to pay attention to, improve, and criticize. So I hope I didn't hit any landmines. If I did, I'm sorry about that. And then uh, some questions that maybe you think about. Uh, I'm curious about people in the room. How are you involved in training? Um, what responsibilities do you, as bioinformaticians, how can you help the community of non-bioinformaticians who are your colleagues? Uh, what do you see a role? Maybe you say, no, I don't have that role. Uh, someone else is going to have to do that. Um, how, how do non-bioinformaticians keep pace? Uh, it's got to be super frustrating. I have many personal stories of helping people through bioinformatics uh, issues and it's hard for them to keep pace because they, they're not operating at the level where they have so much time uh, to think about those things versus teaching or other things. So um, thanks again. Uh, I hope it leads to some discussion and I hope it leads to people thinking about this topic because essentially uh, these are real problems that the community faced. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that's going on with your colleagues. If we can help our colleagues be better bioinformaticians, then we're making better collaborators. And uh, maybe problems that might have taken 20 years to solve could be solved a lot faster if we were uh, all a little bit more savvy. So with that, I want to also thank, of course, Nick and Torba for the wonderful invitation and everybody who I got to meet with today, Michelle. Uh, 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 now your name just left me as soon as I know Boris, as soon as I looked at your face. Uh, and, and everyone else I got to meet. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll some questions.